Øh, vores næste taler hedder George Knapp. Han er født i 1952 i New Jersey. Han er undersøgende journalist. Han har en kandidatgrad i kommunikation fra The University of Pacific. Han har undervist på The University of Pacific også og The University of California i Berkeley. Han er i dag ansat på en tv-station, der hedder KLAS TV i Las Vegas i Nevada og arbejder for noget, der hedder The I-Team. Derudover er han jævnlig vært på den amerikanske landstækkende radiostation Coast to Coast AM. Han skriver jævnligt til en avis i Las Vegas. Uh, George Snap er nok mest kendt som, uh, uh, for sin historie omkring uh, Bob Lazar uh, i slutningen af 1980'erne. 80'erne, og det var altså historien om en videnskabsmand, som hævdede, at han uh, har arbejdet med en UFO på Area 51. Uh, George Snap var yderligere også en af de første vestlige journalister, uh, der undersøgte UFO-historier i det tidligere Sovjetunionen. Uh, han har med jævne mellemrum uh, dækket UFO-historier siden 1980'erne og UFO-relaterede historier. Her for nylig har han lavet et interview med Bob Lazar igen, her 25 år efter historien den brød frem. Så har han også rapporteret sidste år om det, der hedder The Citizen Hearing on Disclosure i Washington D.C., hvor han også lavede et indslag på sin tv-station. Derudover har han vundet 19 Emmy Awards, to Peabody Awards, Mark Twain-prisen fra The Associated Press, og så har han i øvrigt den mainstream-journalist, der måske nok har dækket UFO-fænomenet mest gennem de sidste par årtier. Hjertelig velkommen til George Knapp fra USA. Tak. Thank you. Thanks. I, we're thrilled to be here. My wife Anna, say hi, Anna. Hello. Um, I don't know if you heard this story, but our our, uh, our luggage has become a UFO. We know we know our suitcases were objects. We know they were flying at some point, and we know their uh, their their whereabouts are unknown at this time. So we went out and got got some clothes. I promise. I, we did take showers and we did brush our teeth, so we're not dangerous anymore. Um, i know the, a couple of things about Denmark. I didn't know a whole lot, but I, I knew a couple of things that the, the most important uh, people to know were the Berg family, Jarlsberg and Carlsberg, and, and maybe their, their cousin, the two Bergs. Um, but actually, the, the one thing I did not know about Denmark previously that I have learned in the 24 hours we've been here is uh, about the most powerful, the most intimidating force in this city of Copenhagen, and that is, uh, I mean, more fearsome than the CIA, more fearsome uh, than the men in black, and that's the bicycle mafia. Uh, be afraid, be very afraid, you know, because these guys, they're, they all seem perpetually angry, and they will run you down and not look back. I, <laughs> I'm hoping we escape unscathed here. I thought uh, today we would have some fun and, uh, and I would share with you sort of my journey uh, uh, along uh, chasing this UFO mystery, Bob Lazar, Area 51 in particular, some of the stories and adventures that, uh, adventures in saucer land, I guess you could call it, uh, how I got sucked into this topic and why I become hooked on it permanently and some of the interesting people and, and uh, uh, adventures we've had along the way and share with you my perspective, not only as a, uh, as a man who's interested in this topic, but also as a reporter, as a journalist, because I find myself increasingly at odds with the other people in my profession. I, I think the segue from what we heard from Robbie uh, is seamless in that uh, a lot of what we know about uh, Area 51 and UFOs comes from Hollywood instead of from journalists, uh, people who are in my profession, the people who should be telling this story are news people around the world, U.S. and here, uh, but they aren't. They aren't doing it. And uh, why they aren't doing it is something that we'll explore today. Uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, the, the story that we're here to review today has sort of traveled all over the world many times. And I know in some ways that it sounds preposterous on its face. Uh, the idea that some slightly off-kilter, nerdish guy in glasses could be hired into a classified program even though his educational credentials are practically non-existent, his work history is sketchy at best, he's been discredited and dismissed by people he worked with and for, there is no way that this guy should ever be allowed access to top secret materials or to classified files, no way, let alone that he would be able to blow the whistle on some of the deepest, darkest secrets of all time. And yet, if we press number one, I think you will recognize this guy's face. Snowden. 
You thought I was talking about Bob Lazar, right? We know that Edward Snowden really did work for the CIA and the NSA, even though he had no college degrees, even though he dropped out of high school, he dropped out of the military, he was working as a security guard right before he was hired by the CIA and then later the NSA, private contractors for the NSA. He was able to access the most sensitive information in the US government, which he subsequently and promptly leaked. It's run number two. Uh, I am here to talk about another slightly nerdish whistleblower, a guy named Bob Lazar. Is it fair to compare Bob Lazar and Edward Snowden? I think it is. And I'll take you through this twisted tale step by step, and you can tell me if this comparison is valid or not. Both of these guys worked on classified projects for spooky agencies. Both presumably were not qualified to be in their positions, and so a lot of people have doubts about them as a result. Their personal lives were spotty. Their educational credentials were questionable. Both were very bright guys whose lack of former credentials was not an impediment to getting work in places that seemingly should be off limits to them. Uh, I think Bob Lazar's story, the one you're about to hear, demonstrate that those three-letter agencies that we talk about in UFO gatherings like this will hire anyone if it means there's a better chance of getting the job done. Uh, it's the same reason that the CIA came to my hometown, Las Vegas, to hire mafia guys to help kill Fidel Castro because those are the guys who could get the job done. That really happened. It's why deals were cut with the CIA and the DEA and various drug cartels over the years, or why we had on the government payroll, the US government payroll, these scumbag dictators like Manuel Noriega or Saddam Hussein. It's why journalists and entertainers have been recruited over the decades. I mean, these agencies do what they need to do to get the job done. They will make a deal with the devil if that's what it takes. And I think that relates directly to the story of Bob Lazar that we're going to hear. It's now 25 years since I got sucked into this world of Area 51 and flying saucers and Bob Lazar. Uh, November, next month, will mark the 25th anniversary of when we went public with Bob's identity. And uh, I'll tell you some stories as we go along, but right up until the minute when I revealed his name and showed his face for the first time, Bob was grabbing the videotape. I mean, 10 minutes before we went on the air, um, uh, trying to grab that tape because he had changed his mind. He is the most, as you will hear, he's, if he's the UFO messiah, he's the most reluctant messiah you're ever gonna hear about. Um, I had no idea, of course, when I started this thing, that 25 years later, the story would still be going, that people would still be asking questions about it, that it would travel all over the world many times over. You know, I was pretty sure at the time it was gonna change Bob's life, there was no question about that, um, and I guessed it would probably cause at least some kind of fleeting interest in the time in the base itself, in Area 51, the one that with no name, the one with many names. But I had no idea that this was gonna change my life so dramatically as well, and it has, I mean, I'm here. I, I'm speaking to an audience in, in Copenhagen about Area 51, uh, and it's a long way from home. It's just an amazing little journey. Uh, since the theme of this gathering is sort of uh, about UFOs and the media, I thought I would uh, explore with you how this story has spread, uh, how it became sort of a, a transcendent meme, uh, the way in which this story has spread. I think by itself, that mechanism would be of interest to those three-letter agencies, intelligence agencies, in, in how this thing goes around the planet. And also to sociologists, you know, certainly to academics who study media, information theory. It has been uh, kind of astonishing, at least from my end, and I've had a pretty good seat. Uh, I started as a journalist in Las Vegas um, back in 1991, excuse me, 81, and I work mostly in television, but I've also done print, and as, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, I do some radio here and there. And over the years, I think I've probably covered just about every kind of news story you could imagine uh, in Las Vegas, what you would expect a Las Vegas reporter to cover. O organized crime, political corruption, sex scandals, uh, celebrity, uh, goofballs, environmental catastrophes, drought, the foreclosure crisis, drug dealers, gun runners, murders, bikers, fires, stick-ups, pot dealers, crack peddlers, scams, rip-offs, scumbags, boneheads, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. <laughs> I, mean, I covered it all along the way. And uh, some of those stories I've broken have been pretty good, uh, some of them not so good, and in my hometown at least, I'm considered a pretty good reporter, or at least I was. All that kind of changed in 1989 when I became the UFO guy. Uh, I'm sure this is true for most of you who are here in this room, because in your family, in your circles, 
you're the UFO guy or gal, right? Uh, if there's a UFO sighting in, in uh, Norway or something, and it makes it into the paper, people in your family, crazy Uncle Bob or something, comes and asks you about what you think about the UFO story. We're all the UFO people, so you're going to be able to relate to some of the things I'm going to tell you about here. Um, I am the Area 51 guy. I'm the UFO guy in my community. It's as if it's tattooed on my butt. I'm sure it'll be mentioned what... <laughs> When I die, that's going to be right there in the obituary uh, in describing what I did in my life, is that I was the UFO guy in Area 51. I mean, not a day goes by when I don't get emails from uh, Ecuador or Iceland or somewhere in between uh, about a UFO sighting or a flying saucer event. Everywhere I go in Las Vegas, and my wife can tell you about this, we get stopped and people want to talk about UFOs. We're sitting and having dinner, people will come up and slide into the booth and they want to tell me their story. And, um, you know, that, that's okay to some extent, and I understand it. And they want to ask the same question. Uh, what do I really think about UFOs? Well, the reality is they don't want my opinion about UFOs. They want to tell me their UFO story because they've, everybody's got one. So it's at restaurants. I'm in a grocery store, uh, in a bar, standing in a urinal at a men's room. Um, people want to tell me about the UFO stories. That's a real thing. Hey, do you really believe that stuff? Um, and I'm okay with that. But for some reason, it drives my colleagues in journalism crazy. Uh, it just drives them nuts. They don't know how to handle it. The, the, the general public seems deeply interested in this subject. And every time we do a UFO story or some kind of series on television, the ratings spike. They go up. It indicates the public is hungry for reliable information on this topic. And yet, other journalists, who presumably should be, uh, you know, servicing the needs and the interests of the, of the public, well, don't want to touch it. And it's just really strange. I mean, it's a great subject, potentially the biggest story in the history of the planet. And even if it weren't true, even if this was some kind of a mass hallucination long term, it would still be a huge story. Plus, from my perspective as a journalist, it's a hell of a lot of fun to chase this around. I get to come to Copenhagen, for example. I mean, uh, but to my colleagues, the folks in this room, all of us, myself included, are UFO buffs, UFO believers, UFO crazies. I mean, it's subtle terms like that that they use in their stories, UFO buffs and believers. It's tools that are used by journalists to sort of put UFO folks in their place. Uh, you know, those who don't believe the subject matter is legitimate, they're called uh, skeptics or scientists, but the, the rest of us are buffs and believers. Uh, I never thought of myself as a buff or believer. I'm not the UFO reporter, I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter who happens to be interested in UFOs, and there, there's a, a distinct difference there. I think it's a legitimate news story. And as I said, this has driven my colleagues in journalism really crazy. Um, 1989, as I said, is the year that I officially went nuts, because uh, that's when we broke the story about Bob Lazar and Area 51. And, and uh, when I had broken those other stories I mentioned, you know, I'm just a reporter. When I talk about UFOs in Area 51, I'm crazy, I'm a fruitcake, at least in the eyes of my colleagues. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have been pilloried by radio disc jockeys in the morning when they run out of uh, belch, barf, and fart jokes or something, they'll take a shot at me. Uh, my friends at Nevada's largest uh, newspaper, the Review Journal, have had a lot of fun at my expense over the years. Um, that one of the first, they've done a, a series of editorial cartoons that I have on my wall at home, by the way. One of them showed me with a butterfly net uh, chasing a flying saucer. That was the first one. There was one that had, uh, it was called the Marshmallow Head Chronicles. And it was two extraterrestrial hitmen had come to Earth and they had their ray guns here. They were coming to kill me because I'd spilled these UFO secrets. But they're standing looking at, a, at two ga gasoline pumps. And the one guy says to the other, of course they are Earthmen, but which one is George Knapp? Um, <laughs> I think they're making fun of maybe my stout figure or something like that. I had done a, a series of reports about alleged alien abductions and, you know, the medical procedures that come along with that that the abductees talk about. And the, uh, the Review Journal had a column, they called it, the headline was, they were kidnapped by extraterrestrials. And they, they talked about the medical procedures and they dubbed me a grand mullah in the Church of Cosmic Proctology, which uh, 
I thought that was funny. Uh, the newspaper critic, he was writing a story about how people were rushing at home at night to see my stories about UFOs, the second series that we ever did. He said that they were rushing home not because they care about flying saucers, but because they wanted to be there, quote, when George finally goes bull goose loony and does the big crack up on the screen, his eyes going buggy and rolling free in their sockets. sockets. Will he crash and burn before our very eyes? That was in our newspaper. Funny stuff. I figure it comes with a territory. I'm a, I'm a public figure, I'm not thin-skinned about it. I'm okay with it because I know the public's okay with it. Uh, I don't write stories for them to be read by other journalists. I write them for the public to read. And this is a subject that the public is interested in. The part that bothers me, and, and since we are talking about UFOs and media, the part that bothers me is that reporters and columnists other journalists are so willing to write this story off, to dismiss it, to make fun of it, to poke fun at you and me and anybody else who's interested in it without doing any of the work. They do the wisecracks because it's easy, and they don't do the work. Uh, it, they've certainly never spent hundreds of hours sitting out there in the dark and the dust of the desert around Area 51 waiting for something to happen, trying to dodge these security patrols and coyotes and dust devils, things of that sort, trying to keep from getting arrested or busted uh, by the helicopter that are out there. They haven't read the books, they haven't read the documents, they had, haven't interviewed the witnesses, none of the stuff that you would do in any other kind of story. That's your job, is to do that kind of stuff before you make a judgment about a particular topic or the credibility of a witness or something like that. And I'm sure many of you feel the same way. I don't know what the coverage is like here in Denmark. Pia was telling me you don't get a whole lot of serious m media coverage, but maybe that can change. They see all of us in this room as nuts. And, and while I think that is terribly unfair and inaccurate in a general sense, the fact is, and you know it as well as I do, that this subject does attract a lot of people whose elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. You know, um, For the past couple of weeks, I've been getting uh, emails from this lady in California who uh, wants me to contact the former director of the CIA, Admiral James Woolsey. She wants him to stop harassing her via electronic mind control uh, she's, he, Woolsey, she says, has been forcing her to have sex with a large contingent of Asian men who she doesn't know. So she's been banging these Asian guys and she's blaming the CIA guy and wants me to see if I can get him to stop it. I'm not sure I can help her out. When I first got started in this, uh, it did the first series on the UFO stuff in Area 51, I get contacted by this lady, she's calling me up every day, gotta talk to me, gotta see me in person, can't discuss this uh, on the phone, she had to see me, I fine, I finally relented. She shows up at the station, she's wearing the skimpiest possible halter top and holding this kid, who it turns out of course is an alien hybrid baby, and within the first five minutes I met this lady, I knew details about her sex life that I didn't wanna hear because she said it was while she was engaged in a certain sex act with her boyfriend out on their front porch that she looked up and saw her first flying saucer. And she told me this, and I'm not making up one word of this. Uh, she told me this elaborate story about how they had beamed her up on the ship. She'd been up there a couple of times. And the first time she was up there, uh, she was in a lineup with other earth women and they looked, looked her over and they told her, you know, in our, they had her in bathing suits, like a Miss America pageant or something. And they told her, in their alien opinion that she didn't, needed to get breast implants. And again, I'm not making this up. And that was the one part of the story I could really believe because there was ample physical evidence staring me in the face right there. <laughs> um, I get these letters from this 75-year-old woman in Northern California. She says she has these sexual romps with aliens every time her husband leaves for town. They live on a ranch. Every time he leaves, the aliens come and have their way with her. And uh, she even drew me an anatomically correct uh, picture of what alien genitalia looked like. Uh, you want to you open up that on, a, on an empty stomach in the morning. It's not something that... <laughs> I, I have been pestered by a millionaire transsexual abductee, by a guy who says he's the twin brother of Jesus Christ, who says aliens are coming and they're really mad. Uh, I had a guy fly from Australia one time. Used, he said he used the last money he had in his bank account to fly to see me and to see if I would go to Area 51 and use my contacts out there to tell the aliens to stop abducting him. Now that's a sad, that's a sad story. It's funny, but it's sad at the same time because that guy really thought he was being abducted and he thought I could possibly help him talk to some aliens out at Area 51. Uh, I had this guy who contacted me and I don't know how I got sucked into going to his house, but he 
convinced me that he had worked for the military, he had some UFO information. He says, I communicate with aliens on a regular basis. And he showed me the device, and it was a, it, we went out into his backyard, and it was a, a bird bath with an old record rack on top and a headlight from a car that was just sitting there, like it was not connected to anything. That this guy said that was his device for uh, communicating with aliens. I get uh, letters from alleged aliens that tell me they're watching me. I get them sending me poems and songs. I've had assorted death threats over the years from people who say that they say that they're the government and they're going to get me. They say I'm the government. Uh, they think I'm an agent. I mean, been around the block on this. Uh, I went on the Montel Williams TV talk show one time. It just Somebody just sent us a copy of it. And there was a, people on there, it wasn't just abductees. They were abductees who'd been aliens in a previous lifetime. And I'm supposed to follow that. Um, you know, so it, 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 well, let's roll some video, the next one, the Area 51 video. It kind of comes with the territory. So uh, for major media, you know, that's all they see is people like that. They never get beyond the obvious. They never start to look at... Uh, Area 51, the legitimacy, you can turn the video down, low, I mean the audio down, the legitimacy of whether there's a real story there or not. Um, so I, I think it's really their loss because they're missing the boat. This is a story that got out anyway, Area 51. As mentioned, it's known all over the world now. It's created an oxymoron of sorts of the highest order, the world's best known secret base. How can you be so well known and secret at the same time? It's kind of odd. It's a place that is famous for being secret. Uh, and for decades, for decades, the government has pretended it wasn't there. It's their own fault. Area 51, you know, this uh, most classified military technology in America's arsenal has been tested out there. It's a place where constitutional protections, legal protections do not apply. It's a place where environmental laws in our country are exempted. It's where you can be shot just for walking into the place. Area 51, also known as the Box, the Ranch, the Watertown Strip, and Dreamland. It's the base that began in 1955. Uh, it's the place where the U-2, that's the, the camo dudes that sit up on the, on the, on the uh, hill. If you try to walk up to Area 51, they're the ones that are come and grab you. Uh, and they have cameras all over. The security is really oppressive. Uh, they, if you get too close, they'll fly helicopters, jets, all kinds of things at you. They have, uh, they have motion detectors 12, 15 miles away from the base out on public land that will let them know if your car drives down that road, they know you're coming so they can get ready. They have all kinds of sophisticated technology uh, to, to tell them when somebody is trying to get in. I've had all kinds of people offer to, hey, let's sneak in there. And I tell them, that's a really bad idea. Well, look, let's get a whole bunch of Winnebago's and we'll go <laughs> driving across the border and they can't stop all of us. Uh, yes, yes, they can. And uh, so I've, I've tried to talk them out of that stuff. Um, you know, Area 51, even without Bob Lazar, is a pretty interesting place. The U-2, the SR-71, stealth technology, all manner of CIA monkey business has been taking place out there over the years. It's a fascinating place, but the history of Area 51 and the history of my, my own personal history all changed a day, and it was 1987, two years before Bob Lazar, a guy named John Lear walked into the TV station and told me a story. And Lear had a certain amount of credibility at KLES. His father, of course, had invented the Lear jet. John had run for the state senate. He was an ex-CIA employee who had flown basically every aircraft in the world. And he had helped us break a really big story. My boss was a guy named Ned Day, who is a, a muckraking, crusading journalist in, in Nevada. He's dead now. But at the time, he had broken the story. It was a huge story about the existence of the stealth fighter. John Lear would go out to Area 51, look around, take photos like these, and he knew that something like a stealth fighter was flying around out there. So he and his buddy Jim Goodall told Ned Day. Ned Day breaks the story. It goes national, it goes international about the existence of this strange technology out there. Ned gets pulled in by the FBI. They hauled him in and put a bright light. It was like right out of a movie scene. How dare you endanger national security? Don't you know this puts everyone in the country at risk and the Russians are going to find out all this stuff? He was really worried that he was going to go to prison for a while. And of course, his ultimate answer to them was, look, you may have thought you had a secret out there with this technology, but if I, as a reporter, can find it out, then certainly the Russians can find it out. So I did you a favor. Anyway, John Lear gave us that information about stealth technology, so he had credibility with us. He walked into the station with a big stack of UFO documents and dropped them on Ned's desk. 
And uh, Ned said, look, I'm not interested in this. I can't do this story. If it was true that there's UFOs or flying saucers at Area 51, I'd already know about it. So it can't be true. Uh, so he gave John the brush off. I was eavesdropping, as good reporters tend to do. And I said, hey, let me take a look at that stuff. So I started reading his pile of UFO documents. It included the MJ-12 papers and some other things, citing reports from, oh, these are some of the spy planes that have been tested out at Area 51. This video had been classified for a long time, but they finally released it decades later. Um, anyway, so I started reading John's stuff, and um, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And at the time, I produced a show called On the Record. It's a little public affairs program. It airs at 6 o'clock in the morning, and nobody watches it. Normally, it'd be a show that you'd have somebody. That's the A-12, which was also developed out there. And that's footage from Area 51. Um, anyway, so we have John Lear uh, on, on the record, this show that I did that nobody normally watches, and the phone starts ringing off the hook. And so I had him on a second time, and I got an even bigger response from the public, and I thought, hey, this is kind of interesting. Maybe I'm going to have to look into this UFO topic. So I started reading it, everything I could get my hands on. And I figured, this is how cocky I was at the time, uh, I figured, well, what the heck, you know what this topic needs is a good reporter. Give me six months, I'll have this baby all figured out. You know, I'll, I'll have this mystery solved. And here it is 27 years later, and I still have no idea what's going on. Um, so that's how I sort of got sucked into it. John Lear had, had given me this information. I read it. I find it interesting. The third time I had John on this program, he slipped a hint that he knew a guy who'd just been hired at Area 51. Don't want to say too much about it. But if this goes public, if he goes public with the information, it's going to blow the lid off this story. I thought, well, oh, I'm going to keep that in mind. Well, the guy that he knew turned out to be Bob Lazar. I'll skip some of the steps about how we, we ended up meeting. Let's play a little clip of the Lazar, the 25th. This sort of give us a recap of the story. I don't know. Sometimes I really do regret it, regret it and almost, I, I almost feel like apologizing to him, saying that, you know, I'm sorry I let things out. Can I have my job back? 25 years after he was forever transformed into Bob the UFO guy, Bob Lazar says he regrets ever talking about flying saucers or a secret base in the Nevada desert or any of the things that made his name known all over the world. There isn't a day I, I don't get emails and, you know, I try and get this across to him. Look, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You know, well, I don't believe the story. Great. Pass it around. <laughs> You know, I really don't want you to because it makes life difficult for me. A quarter century ago, not many people outside of Nevada had ever heard of Area 51, the mysterious base 100 miles north of Las Vegas, a place the government said didn't exist. It was the location of choice for all manner of black projects, spy planes that were kept secret from the public. And that's my driveway, that's Bob, that's Gene Huff, and uh, Bob's wife Tracy and Chris. And uh, we're just waiting there for uh, 5 o'clock to roll around. Former CIA pilot John Lear remembers the day that Area 51 became a household name. This is home video he shot as a KLAS news truck prepared to broadcast a live interview from Lear's home. Lazar was understandably nervous. Yeah, he was nervous because he was putting it all out on the line there. And uh, here he was going to, you know, reveal all this secret that he'd signed, you know, that he was going to uh, never tell anybody. It's uh, not only a crime against the American people. It's a In the interview, the Lazar's community. face was hidden and he used a pseudonym, Dennis, which was the first name of his boss out in the desert. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers. Flying Lazar claimed he worked intermittently at a location called S4 south of Groom Lake, the main facility of Area 51. He said the hangars had been built into the side of a mountain disguised as desert, and inside were a set of nine flying saucers. Months later, he revealed his identity to the world and said the technology he'd worked on was from somewhere else, that it was being taken apart to figure out how it worked. Okay, so he says, he told us, man, I remember that day so clearly. In May of 1989, we put him on the air. I had not interviewed him before. Uh, we had somebody cancel an interview, a live interview for our 5 o'clock news when I was anchoring there. And we said, well, maybe that saucer guy would do it. So we put him on, and the phone went crazy. People could not believe that. My bosses go rushing in. Is this guy for real? And my news director and I, Bob, Bob Stodall, said, 
gosh, if this story is true, if we can verify at least some of it, it's going to be gigantic. So we started a project. I spent the next eight months working on trying to verify Lazar's background and, and any other details that we could come up with about Area 51. We had heard rumors about something that looked like flying saucers being tested out there for a long time, yet no one had ever come forward until Bob. Um, so he said there's nine flying saucers into the, built into the hangar in the side of the mountain of the facility known as S4. He said that he saw one of these things that was in flight. He called it the sport model, and it looked like, you saw the, uh, the artwork there, it looked like what uh, Billy Myers beam ships, like the, the sport model that he called it. Uh, he said that uh, antimatter reactor would create its own gravitational field, uh, that gravity was in fact the key to interstellar travel, that it allowed one of these spaceships that generates its own gravitational field, it could bend space and time, which is what a lot of people, Jacques Vallée and others, have said it looks like how these flying saucers get around. The fuel, Lazar said, was something called Element 115, a super heavy element that did not exist at the time, but does now. I mean, it's preposterous stuff. It's outrageous. It's ridiculous. Who in the world could believe such a story coming from a guy with a sketchy background like Bob. It turns out quite a few people believed it because the story exploded like a bomb. I mean, it launched thousands of product lines, made untold numbers of media appearances possible. The meme was on the loose. Let's play this next one. And the coup de grace, Area 51. You, you could have just handed me a piece of the UFO from Area 51. There have never been any spacecraft. There's no Area 51. <laughs> There's no recovered spaceship. Oh, excuse me, Mr. President? That's not entirely accurate. It would probably take an Indiana Jones-sized warehouse to stash all the pop culture references to Area 51, the oh-so-secret facility, the place that did not officially exist for decades, is the rock star of military bases, literally. There's a rock band named Area 51, and another named Element 115, which is supposedly the fuel for flying saucers. There's an Area 51 video game, an Area 51 bar. What better way to unwind after a long day than a glass of Groom Lake red wine from the Ailey Inn? Maybe spend a few minutes staring at the paintings you picked up at the Area 51 art show, while perhaps listening to the Bob Lazar music video. The story that Bob Lazar told 25 years ago has gone around the world many times over. When you get yourself in position... And in the quarter century since then, the world has beaten a path to Area 51's door. Every major news organization in the world has written stories. The base has inspired documentaries and TV dramas. Dozens of books have been written, fiction and nonfiction, hundreds of news articles, many of them critical of Lazar and skeptical about his background. His tale launched a thousand product lines, every trinket you can imagine, along with assorted businesses, a AAA baseball team, and the world's only extraterrestrial highway running right past the entrance to Groom Lake. Uh, when you president, president Obama you recently made a point of publicly acknowledging Area 51. Uh, what's really going on at Area 51? And former President Bill president, Clinton told Jimmy Kimmel he'd looked into those stories about space aliens. So first I had people go look at the records on Area 51 to make sure there was no alien down there. Even the Kardashians have made a trek out into the desert. That's a security guard. Look, look how that... that uh, you know, that story moved throughout the internet so quickly. And not just the internet, but, but news in itself. Like it was in the first 48 hours after the broadcast, it was in Japan. Back in Las Vegas for a visit, Lazar recalls why he came forward in the first place. He had traveled to the S-4 base only a handful of times, but began to get scared. I began to get worried in that, boy, they've given me all this classified information they're not calling me anymore. They won't take my phone calls. And in the meantime, apparently, they're deciding what to do with me. Look how bright it's getting. Look at it now. For a variety of personal reasons, Lazar couldn't keep the story to himself. He shared his tale with John Lear and Gene Huff. They and a few others made treks out to the outskirts of S-4 because Lazar said he'd learned when the test flights of the saucer would take place. Three weeks in a row, a glowing object appeared over the mountain. Look how bright it's getting. Look at it now. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs. The time when Bob said there would be a test, there was a strange light jumping around in the sky 
above the location where he said it would be at the time and date he said it would be. You know, here, the craft took off when I said it was taking off from past the, the mountain range, which was Papoose Lake, S4, south of Area 51, you know, in a restricted area. So it's not like anyone was out there with a model plane or anything. And, uh, you know, flew around in incredible maneuvers that impressed everybody to the point where we got scared and got behind a, a, a car, fearing the thing was going to explode. But um, really, how do you explain it? It's bright right now. I can't tell you how many times I wish, gosh, did, shouldn't I have copyrighted a piece of that or something? The wife reminds me quite a few times uh, with the thousands of products and books and TV shows and, and things of that sort, the references to Area 51 that have gone everywhere. Uh, Robbie mentioned about the movies and the, the idea of hyper-reality, and, and that is so true. I can remember being, there was a special screening of the movie Independence Day, and I had already been reporting on Area 51 for 10 years, you know, pounding away at these stories in UFO circles that had gone everywhere, but it was still sort of filtering out to the general public. And we had the special screening of the movie, and there's that scene where the Secretary of Defense says, ah, oh, Mr. President, yeah, there really is an Area 51. And people in the audience are going, see, I told you it was real. And I was like, I, I've been reporting on this for years now, and now it took a movie to tell you it's real, that there really is a place called Area 51? Uh, by the way, as a side note, I told P I was bringing some stuff along. It, it's in the bags, it, in the baggage, wherever that is, but some, some uh, uh, trinkets and souvenirs from Area 51. I got a ali little alien Christmas ornament with an alien on it, a couple of hats from the Area 51 Museum, which is the Atomic Testing Museum. It's got a room full of stuff, about half of it from my house. The Area 51 uh, baseball team, I got a hat from that. An Area 51 cookbook, anyway, I'm dead, donating it to your organization. If you want to bid on it, maybe it'll make some money or something like that. Um, you know, I was thrilled with some of this stuff that uh, President Clinton spoke publicly about Area 51, President Obama spoke about it. Uh, well, he, he did that, by the way, if you'll recall, while he was honoring Shirley MacLaine, which seemed kind of somehow fitting. Uh, but I was a little bit worried when I saw the Kardashians heading to Area 51. In the TV business, there's a phrase known as jumping the shark. When a show has gone too far uh, to be credible anymore, uh, that's what we call it, jumping the shark. And I don't know if the Kardashians may have jumped the shark from the first stop, but when they started going to Area 51, I thought, this has gone too far. Um, you saw at the end of that video clip this original footage of a saucer test flight that Lazar and Gene Huff and John Lear and others had witnessed, not once, not twice, but three weeks in a row. Lazar knew when these test flights would take place. He knew where they would take place. There had been no news stories about it, no coverage uh, in anywhere officially. And to this day, the story is there is nothing at Papoose Lake. There has never been a facility there, even though satellite photos show a road that goes down there. And uh, there's no base, there's no facility, there's nothing but a dry lake bed at Papoose. So how did Bob know? How did he know this stuff? It's one of the points we're going to come back to. Play this next little clip of this, this a little bit of better look at that saucer. That's a, a freeze frame. A, there's some enhancement that was done. That's, that's the object. It was flying above Papoose Lake. And I don't know, it looks like a flying saucer to me. Uh, over the years, dozens of people have captured their own images of things flying around out there. There's a classic sombrero-shaped UFO that was flying around out there, weird lights. Now, some of these things, like everything else, they're misidentifications. They're military planes, secret aircraft, secret platforms of one sort or another. But a heck of a lot of them look like flying saucers. And if we've been flying them out there since the 1950s, which is how long people have been seeing, seeing them, if it's a classified project, when do we get a look? When do they declassify it? When do they roll it out of the hangar? Uh, last year, I don't know if you read this story here, if it got much pu publicity, but the CIA formally announced last year that Area 51 exists. whoop de freaking do You know, Area 51 exists. We've known that it exists. We've got satellite photos. We know people who worked out there. The, the world has no... Yeah, you can stop it. Um, the world has known about it for a long time. So CIA goes public with this announcement. I'm wondering, what are they up to? Well, they, they wanted to use it as an explanation to brush away all reports of UFOs. Don't worry, I think what the words were, remember all those UFOs you were seeing in the 50s and 60s? That was us, ha, ha, ha. I, I don't even, and, you know, at the same time they acknowledged that the base uh, was real, 
they did something else sneaky. They said the real reason that these rumors about flying saucers at Area 51 had been started is because people outside the base were seeing weird things flying around and they mistook them for UFOs. Well, you know, and they, they're implying that these are U-2s and SR-71 and stealth technology. Uh, it's similar to the earlier CIA release that was done a couple of years ago to explain away all UFO sightings. That's all us, they said. It's the agency, it's our secret planes. And they, they made a campaign about it on Twitter. Well, bullshit. It's bullshit. Uh, I don't even know where to start with that. Uh, the, U, the U-2 is a great big gangly plane that has big long wings. It doesn't look like a flying saucer. It doesn't hover silently. It doesn't fly up and down like this. It doesn't land in people's cornfields or backyards. It was designed to not be seen at all. Uh, same for the SR-71, the A-12, the stealth technology. Those are not flying saucers. And it suggests that people are seeing those planes and, and that's the cause of the stories in Area 51 is ridiculous. Um, more importantly, the stories about flying saucers in Nevada didn't start because there were people outside the base seeing things flying around. They started because people inside the base started leaking the information. And one of those people was Bob Lazar. Uh, I'm not gonna try to convince you uh, beyond any doubt that Lazar is telling the truth. For most people, you know, that horse has left the barn. You've already made up your mind about it. Chances are, if you're here to hear some of this, you probably give him at least some credibility. Um, you know, that, that legend is galloping around down the road and, and around the world, and most people have made up their minds, as I said. I, I, I will give you two thoughts on this, though. One is that my belief, it, it's a moot point anyway, as Robbie Graham was saying, because this Area 51 story is now permanently etched into the public consciousness, whether anybody likes it or not. Uh, it's taken on a life of its own, independent of Bob Lazar. Uh, Lazar, by the way, did not work at Area 51, although a lot of people say that. He was at S4, and, and we've already made that distinction. Uh, earlier this year, there was a tour. They now take tours out to Area 51, regular tours. If you, as a tourist, you want to go to Las Vegas and take a drive out there, they'll pu uh, put you in a vehicle, take you right up to the edge of Area 51. You can take a couple of snapshots, and you go back home. Uh, earlier this year, I aired a story about a tour group. They had their driver, who was relatively new uh, to the job, and they're talking, they're yakking at him as he's driving up to the gate. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. He blows right through this sign, the warning sign that says, stop or you will be shot. Uh, he blows right through it. And they're driving along and they're wondering, hey, where's that base? Uh, you know, where's the camo dude? Shouldn't we be stopping here? And all of a sudden, bam, he's right on, on their butt. Uh, pulled him over, pulled out guns, uh, threatened to arrest him. They wrote him up big citations. Uh, the guy can never, is never allowed to go back. Uh, so other drivers will have to go there. But it was a big mess, and I helped negotiate the fine down so these people um, didn't have to uh, dig into their pockets too bad. But as the video from that camera showed, this driver is telling his own reality about you, uh, Area 51. Oh, yeah, the mothership is often out there hovering over the base, and there are secret underground facilities where the aliens, um, they mix up vats of... Uh, human and alien parts and to create these hybrids. I mean, total nonsense, totally made up, but there's the guy who's official tour guide for Area 51 making this stuff up. Um, and it, it sort of goes to the point that it's taken on a life of its own and we couldn't stop it if we wanted to. The second thing I wanted to convey is uh, how we pursued this story as journalists. Um, I did not go into this as a lark, it wasn't a joke. I, I approached it as a story and I knew there were great risks involved in this uh, because of our credibility. Our credibility of the whole station was on the line. If we screwed this up and promoted this guy as, uh, as some UFO messiah and it blew up in our face, we might not ever recover. The station's credibility was on the line. And I know it looks preposterous from the get-go and that many of our co competitors wished it was preposterous, but that's not how it's turned out. Uh, my friend and colleague, Stan Friedman, has been outspoken about uh, Area 51 and Bob Lazar. He thinks it's possible, he buys the idea there could be flying saucers out there, but he doesn't buy Lazar. And he's been way out in front. Uh, I have to give Stan credit for doing some of the legwork. Unlike a lot of Bob's critics, Stan has gone to, area, uh, to MIT and Caltech and looked for Bob Lazar's educational credentials and he found them lacking. And I, I applaud him for that. But because that part of Bob's story is weak, Stan has written the whole thing off, which is what a lot of people have done. 
I don't know how to remind, I've tried to remind Stan about this in person, and I've said it in public a few times, but uh, the, the important thing is with Lazar is that the information about his educational background was in the very first story that we aired. The very first report that identified him, we said we could not verify his background. And I'll, I will confide to you this, I don't believe he ever went to those schools. I don't believe Bob Lazar could get a degree from Caltech or MIT for a very simple reason. At American universities, when you get a degree, an undergraduate degree, you have to take all kinds of core courses in subjects that you may not be interested in. Uh, literature. I cannot possibly imagine, and Anna, you know Bob, I can't imagine Bob Lazar sitting through a class in, a, in American Lit or reading poetry or something like that. He'd never stand for it. There is no way in hell that he sat through that stuff to get a degree. So what do we do? What do we do with that? Do we throw out the story? Uh, would Bob, here's how I rationalize it, is Bob would not be the first person to lie about his educational credentials in order to get a good job. As his friend of a long time, I've given him the opportunity, Bob, look, come, come clean on this. To, let me know about, uh, if, if it's a lie, come clean on it, get it behind you. And he's never given me that, uh, that satisfaction of saying, yeah, it's a lie. He maintains the story. I don't know what the true story is, whether they could make his records disappear. I have found people who said he was at Caltech, who said that they remember him being on the campus, but that's not enough to, uh, to make the point. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter. I don't care whether Bob Lazar went to Caltech. The lie, the fact that he would lie about it is problematic, but I don't think it, it's a reason to toss out the entire story because people do lie about their background in order to get a, a, great, uh, a great job. The thing with Bob is uh, he is an interesting guy. I know a lot of people think that he's a fraud, that he never worked out there. Uh, for me, the key was always, did he work at Los Alamos National Lab? Because it seemed to me that if he had worked at Los Alamos in a scientific capability on classified projects, then it's conceivable that he would have got hired to work at someplace else in the Nevada desert. So we went to Los Alamos. Uh, I went there a couple of times. I started writing letters to them to see if Bob had ever worked there, and they said no. We have no records of him whatsoever. And then I found a, a headline in the Los Alamos newspaper that says, there's Bob Lazar as a physicist. What about that? Nope, we don't have him. He never worked here. Then I found a phone book from the lab that lists his, his name and number. There he is. Uh, well, we still can't find the res the, any records on him. So I wrote to a company, uh, a Kirkmeyer. It's a headhunter company. It hires people uh, for the lab and fills positions in scientific and te technical jobs. They had hired Bob. I called him up. I said, yeah, did you hire him? Do you have records? Yeah, we've got the records on him. We hired him. We got him the job at Los Alamos. Great. Can I get a copy of those? No problem. That, was, uh, uh, that went on for two and a half years, where they first said that they would give me the records. Then they said, then they delayed it. Then they stopped taking my calls altogether. And then they said, quit bothering us. Someone got to him. I mean, they had him, and then they didn't have him. Um, but, I became convinced for other reasons that Bob was there. I talked to people he worked with who said he was there, and then he worked in classified positions, on classified stuff. I went to Los Alamos, and Bob Lazar took us in. It was on a Sunday, and we had a camera rolling on it. He took us into the gate, waves at the guy at the front, they let, him on in, let, let us in, and then he took us into Los Alamos, and it was like a rabbit in his own burrow, taking us through these buildings, uh, obscure places, waving to people along the way, gave us a little tour, all of it recorded on video. How did he know? You know, it's the same like thing with the, uh, the flying saucer test. You don't believe that, that Bob uh, worked at S4 or Area 51. How did he know about the test? There had been no newspaper stories about it. He knew when and where it would take place, and the video captured it. I interviewed all the people that went with him on those trips, and they all verified the story just as he told it. How did he know? Here's some other stuff that he, that he knew. Uh, there was an agency called OFI. Bob thought it was the FBI. I said, who did your background check, you know, when you were getting your security clearance? Ah, I think it was the FBI. It was a guy named Mike Thigpen. I called the FBI up. They said, we don't have any Mike, Mike Thigpen. We don't do background tests. Come to find out what it was is there was an agency called the OFI. Office of Federal Investigation. I had never heard about it before, but sure enough, turns out that's the agency that does background checks for people who work at the Nevada test site. 
And although Area 51 is not part of the Nevada test site officially, it's attached to it, and they do that work. And sure enough, they have an agent named Mike Thigpen. How did he know? How did Bob know that a guy named Mike Thigpen worked for an agency uh, that I had never even heard of before? Those facts were co confirmed. Um, it's, it, it's weird stuff uh, that happened during the, that time period. It's hard to convey to an audience sitting in a room like this, but it was a strange time to live through. Break-ins at Bob's house. They would break into his house, leave all the doors and windows open, and write stuff on his blackboard or move things around. Now, there was a time when he and a friend, he was getting really nervous because strange things were happening in his life. They go to a gym to work out, and Bob started carrying a gun. Uh, somebody had taken a shot at him. He had this gun in the glove box, locks the car, goes into the gym, comes back out an hour and a half later, the cars to the door are open, the windows are rolled down, the glove box is open, the gun is laying there on the seat. It's like somebody wanted him to know he was under surveillance. I would, he would call me in the middle of the night and I'd go over to his house rushing over there and he's peeking out the window, and I know this will make him sound paranoid, peeking out the window holding an Uzi because um, he thought people were messing with him. They were messing with him. I mean, he th they threatened to kill him. They threatened to make him disappear. They were following us around wherever, everywhere we went, into bars, to work. Uh, I had a series of uh, phone calls at the station. This is really ticks me off. People who called up offering to give me additional information about Area 51. And I'll get into some of those specifics in a minute. Six people who had called to offer me additional information uh, and said, yeah, agreed to be interviewed, were visited one right after another. Uh, there was a guy who was a tax preparer. His name was Roy Byram. He did tax returns for offices, officers at Nellis Air Force Base, and he got to know him pretty well. And they were on an out-of-town trip uh, when they were sitting around drinking some beers, and these guys told them about Area 51, flying saucers, S-4, the whole story as told by Bob. He th agrees to tell me that story on the phone, the very next day, he gets visited. These two guys who said they're from the Secret Service, they said, we hear you've been issuing threats against the life of the president, and we can tell you that uh, if you're talking to the wrong people and saying the wrong things, you can go to prison. Well, he saw that as a threat because of him talking to me. There was a lady who works in the Clark County court system. She had been a stenographer for a company called Holmes & Narver. It's a defense contractor. She sat in on meetings at which she took dictation Air Force guys, CIA, and her boss, these contractors, when they talked about Roswell and the Roswell wreckage and some of that material go into Area 51. She said after the meeting, they would not only take all her notes, they would take the ribbon out of the typewriter so that nobody could reconstruct what she had written. And so she was, she told this story to a cop, a police officer who I know, and he offered to make an introduction. So I called this lady up. I said, let's get together. I'll hide your identity. Don't worry, I won't get you in trouble. She agreed to tell me this story. Very next day, she gets a knock on the door, and these two guys show up. They said, we're from Holmes and Narvi. You do know that you're still under a security uh, clearance. You're still under security restrictions. You can't talk to anybody. She goes, what are you talking about? They go, we know that you and your daughter, your daughter lives in LA, you live in Las Vegas, and the two of you travel back and forth a lot. You know, there's a lot of desert out there. Something bad could happen if you were to say the wrong thing. They were threatening her daughter's life. She was scared to death. I tried to get a hold of her 10 years and then 20 years after that, that our first conversation, she still wouldn't talk to me. She was scared. I had a guy who was a, an electrical engineer who had worked at KLAS TV. And he, before working there, he had been at Area 51. And he said he walked into a, a big hangar and there under a tarp was something that looked like a flying saucer. Well, he was living in Seattle at the time that he told me this story, and so I, I, I contacted him. I said, look, we're working on a series about UFOs. Would you give me an interview? Would you do this on camera? I'll black out your face. He goes, yeah, sure. Next morning, I mean, the very next day, there's two guys sitting in a car, uh, clean military uh, haircuts, talking into a radio, sitting out in front of his house, and they followed him to work. And then when he got out of work, they're sitting there and talking on the radio, and they followed him home. He was scared. He knew they were trying to intimidate him, and he wouldn't talk to me. What that told me, six people in a row, boom, 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 same thing, is that they were listening to my phone. And that really ticked me off, that they would monitor, back there before we had the NSA listening to everybody's phones, uh, that they were listening to my phone. And it really ticked me off. But it was real. I had so many people, uh, if, if this story was just about Bob Lazar, we would never have done it, but I had more than two dozen people who had worked at Area 51, 
50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s who told me bits and pieces of the same story. I had the guy who was a golf pro at Nellis Air Force Base who knew all these, uh, all these uh, high-ranking officers who told me the same story about Roswell wreckage going to Area 51 and saucers being tested. And uh, he told me that story. He's another one who got a visit. Uh, there was a guy who, his name is Glenn Pace, and back in the days of above-ground nuclear testing in Nevada, the most nuked place in the world, he was, it was his job as a spotter. He was one of the only people on a Nevada test site that was allowed to use binoculars. So he'd be out there when they would be planning these atomic tests, he'd be in a building, sometimes for days at a time, waiting for the test to take place. And he had these binoculars, he was at a place called Area 15, which looks right over into Area 51. And he said they used to watch these, what looked like flying saucers over Papoose Dry Lake all the time. His boss was an, a German physicist, one of the Nazi scientists who came over under Operation Paperclip named Otto Krauss, who told him about alien technology being tested out there. Uh, I had a guy named Howard Cannon. He was a United States Senator from Nevada. He was a man who practically built Area 51 because he would get all the secret uh, appropriations, the money that went into building it. He was like the father of Nellis Air Force Base. He's a retired Brigadier General uh, from the Air Force, a, a, a decorated war hero. He was very good friends with the men who built Area 51, um, the guys from the Skunk Works, Lockheed. When Howard Cannon lost his last election, they gave him, as a going away present, the ability to fly in the SR-71. There's only 30 people in the world that are 40 people in the world have ever been in one, and he got to fly in it. That's how close he was to these guys. Howard's son, Alan, is a friend of ours, had uh, had these conversations with his dad about UFOs. Howard had never, the senator had never spoken about it publicly, but he finally agreed through his son to tell me the story about Area 51. And I went over and interviewed him, the last interview before he died, and he came this close to spilling it all. His best friend in the Senate was Barry Goldwater. I don't know if you remember that name, but Goldwater had run for president. Goldwater had tried to get into Wright-Patterson, the stories about the Blue Room, and he'd been told, no, you can't get in and you can't ask about it, never ask again. Well, Howard Cannon had the same experience. He told me that story before he died. He l went right up to the edge of saying there's flying saucers at Area 51, and then he said this, what would be the point of telling that? They would deny it, they'd call it a lie. You're never gonna get to see that technology. They're never gonna let it out. So what would be the point? Howard Cannon is a man that I, I believe. One other source I'll tell you about, and then we'll move on. It's a guy I, whose name I can't give you, but there was a book by a lady named Annie Jacobson uh, about Area 51, and it's a tremendous book about the history of all those, those secret planes. Annie Jacobson, at the end of her book, though, has a capper where she says, um, she talked to this old guy who said that there were flying saucers out there, but they're not alien flying saucers. They'd been built by the Nazis, captured by the Russians, and what crashed at Roswell was a, one of these Russian Nazi uh, technology that the, the aliens were not aliens. They were uh, refugees from a concentration camp who just looked like aliens. It's a ridiculous story, but I knew immediately that the source of it was a guy that I had stalked. I stalked him, literally, for three years because I knew he was in a position to know. He had worked at Area 51 in a management capacity, and finally I got him to open up. He invited me to his house. He said, you wanna talk about uh, atomic bombs and testing? And he's going through his scrapbooks, and I'm looking at these pictures of bombs and everything, and he goes, he stops, closes the book, he goes, that's not what you're here to talk about, is it? I said, no, not really. So I know what you're here for, and then he started telling me a story about saucers, aliens, this is a guy who, he's not Bob Lazar. He, his credentials are not uh, questionable. He was in the position to know, and he laid the story out for me. Somewhere along the line, though, he changed it. And by the time I, Annie Jacobson uh, got a hold of him, it was not aliens, which, by the way, he told me that uh, the alien looked like Ross Perot, who was a, a billionaire businessman, a little skinny guy with great big ears. Um, anyway. Uh, along the way, there are some very real uh, people who had told me bits and pieces of the story. It's not just Bob. Let's play one of them. This guy named Jim Goodall uh, wrote books about stealth technology. He was a friend of John Lear. Did you ever get any information about a facility at Papoose, like the one you described? I have a, uh, a friend of mine. He's a, he's a retired uh, senior master sergeant. He was early on in the F-117 program. And they had full, they, their badge 
area, uh, restricted area badge, he can go anywhere in the Nevada test site, up to and including Area 51. So they had a Humvee, and they drove around the, the, uh, the was it Groom Range? Yeah, yeah. Groom Range. And they're on Papoose Lake. There isn't, there, isn't, there isn't anybody around, and all of a sudden, they're surrounded by guys in black uh, uniforms, wanting to know, with their hands on their weapons, wanting to know who they were, what are you doing here? And my buddy said, we're just, we have some, we have some downtime, we're just exploring the area. He said, you turn around and you leave and don't come back. They just kind of popped up out of nowhere? He doesn't know where they came from. He didn't see any vehicles, all of a sudden, they were there. And he left. It was, it was three or four guys with him. They well, left. What do you make of that? That there might be something at Papoose, or was, or? Well, according to Bob, that's where, that's where the, uh, the nine hangarettes are, in the, it, you know, camouflage in the side of the mountain. Uh, I'll give you one other thing about uh, S4 and Papoose. There was a guy named Jerry Friedman. He's an archaeologist. And you wouldn't think an archaeologist has anything to do with uh, flying saucers. Jerry Freeman was studying the path of the 49ers. That was the, there was a gold rush of 1849 when thousands of people uh, fled west to try to uh, strike it rich. And a lot of them uncovered wagons and settlers and they, they uh, had a certain paths that they followed. And Jerry Freeman was trying to reconstruct the path that the 49ers had taken. And he thought that they had gone right straight across the Nevada test site and in fact had been at Papoose Lake. So what he did was, very bold of him, he infiltrated the test site from going west to east and walked all the way across it, dodged security patrols. He would walk uh, in the nighttime and then hide during the day, and he made it all the way across. Let's show the Freeman stuff. He made it all the way across the test site uh, to Papoose Lake. These are pictures that he had set up with an automatic camera. That's Papoose behind him. That's the place where Bob Lazard said he worked. So Freeman, again, uh, walking at night and, uh, and uh, hiding in the day, gets all the way to Papoose. He finds the evidence he's looking for. The 49ers had carved some, something into the rocks there. But as he's sitting out there at night, um, right at Papoose, uh, it's a sad story by the way he died, a doorway opens up. He said he's sitting there and a doorway of light opens up in the middle of the sky and Things come out, people come out, objects come out, and then it closed up again. Now, he's not a flying saucer guy. Uh, he walked all the way across the, across the test site, not realizing that that land is still contaminated with all kinds of uh, nuclear fallout. And he died of cancer two years after uh, his, his journey. But anyway, he gave a little piece that sort of goes along with what Jim Goodall just said about people coming out of nowhere. Remember, Papoose Lake, where Lazar said uh, there's this facility built in the side of the mountain, uh, does, you know, there is nothing there officially. Uh, the last piece of information is the, some, some um, a, a UFO guy named James Wildermuth. I never knew of the guy before. He's a European guy here. And uh, he sent me these images that he found on Google Earth. Um, normally, this would have been cleaned up, but somehow he found it. You tell me what it looks like. Anyway, he, uh, he used Google Earth to take a good hard look at this, and he found some lines uh, on the side of Papoose that looked like exactly what Lazar had been describing. He, puts the, he put the pins in there, but you can see the thin outline of these lines. Nine of them. Nine containers. Um, a friend of mine was an investigator for Congress, and he had, he had the highest security clearances. He thought that something was really going on at Area 51. I gave him a briefing, and he made them let him in. They flew him in a blinding snowstorm to S4 in Papoose, but they took him to the other side of the facility. He got out and looked around. His name was Dick D'Amato. He worked for a, a senator who oversaw the budget and looked around out there, and he said this was five years after Bob Lazar's story came forward, and um, he said there was nothing there. But he didn't look in this side. And it sure looked like hangar doors to me, or at least some lines that indicated that something could be there. That's good. Uh, I want to give you a couple of uh, pieces of, of what Lazar says now, because his, his views on things have changed quite a bit, as you might imagine. So many crazy stories have been told about Bob over the years, that he's running a meth lab, that he's got a string of hookers down in South America, that he's dead. 
Uh, once a year, somebody comes up with a story that Bob is dead. It's no wonder that he's tried to leave all this stuff behind him and wants nothing more to do with it. Uh, it took me a long time to coax him into doing this interview earlier this year to recognize the 25th anniversary. I'm hoping to talk him into going on Coast to Coast, maybe in November. Uh, but I wanted to uh, sort of share with you a couple of the pieces, the stuff that he is comfortable talking about, and that is the, the technology, uh, the science involved. As I mentioned at the beginning, he uh, claims that these craft operate on an anti-gravity sort of mechanism. Let's play that clip where he talks in detail about. That alone is something amazing. Look, that can change everything we know today. Just having a machine to produce artificial gravity. Because look, look at what that does. We know gravity, space, and time are all tied together. There are your shields, like on Star Trek, that you know, deflect micrometeorites. There is your protection from radiation without heavy shielding. There is something that with an intense enough focused field, you can actually bend space. And there is something that can actually alter the flow of time. I mean, that's the missing piece of pie. Didn't they actually freeze a, a, a flame, candle? A flame freeze. Yeah, now that's when it was connected to the gravity amplifiers where they could focus it. And uh, that they, was- They froze a candle? A yeah, they had a, they had a candle lit uh, to set it up for you. Um, again, there's a large, in the craft itself, there are three long pipes. Um, I'd say, uh, well, I don't know about, what's that? Three, four feet in diameter, maybe f five feet long. Um, anyway, they dangle the three of them at the bottom of the craft. These produce gravitational waves and they can focus them to a point or spread them apart. Those um, are what you call the wave guides? Yeah, okay. yeah. They're part of the uh, power source control mechanism and the uh, wave, well, the wave guide is what I actually call the interlink between okay. them, but that, that's the gravitational engine. Um, they had one of those devices out along with the subsystem that connects it. So they can produce the power from the reactor, it runs the gravity amplifier, and they can focus and change the gravity beam that comes out of it. They took, a, they were speaking of Barry, took a candle, put it close to the mouth of it, lit it, a normal flickering candle flame, and then activated the reactor. The gravity wave came out as expected, and the candle flame remained luminous and stopped moving. And which defies I mean, physics. Yeah, because look, like if it's going to freeze it, the photon should stop being emitted. If it's going to you know, change the characteristics, look, how can the combustion continue to take place without the convection inside the flame? Because actually, the reason a flame is elongated is not, not really because of the heat, it's because of gravity. Because gravity pulls down and, you know, convection moves flames upward. It's why in, in a zero gravity environment, flame is a ball, obviously. There's nothing to pull things around. But anyway, if, uh, look, if you negate the gravity around it, why is it still pointy? How can it still be making light? And why doesn't it move? Well, I mean, heat, from what Barry said, it's not just gravity, but it's also time locked. You've they distorted froze a the- frame of time. Yeah, they it essentially froze a, a, a piece of time there. and I, you know, what do you say? I mean, you're, it's empirical evidence. You're looking at it's it. It's not, it's not a, see it. it doesn't make sense that you could see it. And uh, at, look, it, it, the stuff I saw there was the most unbelievable, literally, because it, it, it defied what, what we knew as physics. And uh, at least I thought it did. And maybe what we knew was, <laughs> a little incorrect and just needed viewing from a different angle. Um, we do know now that research into anti-gravity is at the top of the list of what American uh, tech companies are doing and the uh, Defense Department folks are doing and anti-gravity propulsion is something they want very badly. Bob said that the key to it was this element 115. He had a piece of it. I saw it. Um, in fact, he had a little experiment they did with what's called a cloud chamber where they had, it looked to me like light. They had a piece of this 115 in this chamber, they put some smoke in it and it seemed, and then had a beam of light through it and the light bent. Um, 
Bob, at one point, when he thought he was going to die, had this piece of 115 in a, uh, it was in a lead casing, in a disc-shaped uh, casing, and he had it in front of a particle accelerator at his house, and he had the accelerator on, and all he had to do was flip a button. If this stuff was real, as he described it, flipping that button would hit it with, I don't know, it's protons, or electrons, whatever it was, that would make it explode and annihilation that would have left a great big hole in uh, Las Vegas. Now, he had that piece. I saw the experiment. What happened to it, uh, that's, that's a story for another time. Uh, it, it's, it's in a spot now where nobody could get to it, but uh, it's still there. One of these days, maybe after Bob's gone, I'll go dig it up. Um, as at the time that he told us the story about element 115, element 115 did not exist. It does exist now. It's been synthesized. They've made it in a lab. It only lasts for uh, microseconds, but it is real. They've confirmed that it's now on the element chart. And in this piece, Bob talks about uh, 115. They finally did uh, synthesize element 115 that had the properties that I, that I stated. Um, not, um, but it wasn't stable. Yeah, it wasn't stable. Uh, now, each element has isotopes. For instance, you know, let's talk about hydrogen. We're all familiar with hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has three isotopes. They're all hydrogen. There's hydrogen, protium, would be the technical name, deuterium, and tritium. Well, tritium is a radioactive hydrogen. Uh, deuterium is another stable isotope of hydrogen. And regular protium, ordinary hydrogen, is the hydrogen we all know. They're all hydrogen. They have different amounts of neutrons in them. Um, they all have one proton, which makes them hydrogen. Now, this is true for all elements. You can have the amount of protons in them determines what element it is. So element 115 has 115 protons in it. It's element 115. Now, depending on the number of neutrons it has, it will still be element 115, but it can be any number of isotopes of it. We've synthesized 115. We made one isotope. We have a radioactive one. Now they just need to continue on working with it. I mean, they made just a few atoms, but uh, we'll see what other isotopes they come up with. One of them or more is going to be stable, and it will have the exact properties that or, I said. Or could we make it? Or does it have to be natural? As you speculated well, about that. Well, before. it's natural. It'd be difficult to find it to get some usable material. I, I do not think you can make that synthetically. It's just, it takes too much time. I mean, to make you know, an ounce of it or even a gram would take a tremendous amount of time because not all the interactions are successful. I mean, you can bang particles together all day long and one may get stuck and then you've got an atom and how do you contain you know, this single atom? So how do we get 500 pounds of it? Where'd that come from? Well, it, it, it had to either be uh, synthesized by the extraterrestrials that bought it in the first place, or, you know, maybe there was a, a location where they came from where, look, this was a naturally occurring material. We know that all the material in the universe, essentially all the atoms of all elements, came from hydrogen. I mean, all you really need is, it, it is just atoms of hydrogen to make anything. Once they start collecting together large quantities of them, gravity just begins to push them together under their own weight. So it's sort of like a Rorschach test. It's, aha, they made 115. He was right. It really does exist. Somebody who doesn't want to believe it says, 115 doesn't behave anything like Bob Lazar said. It's sitting around in a pile of 500 pounds or something. Right? I mean, it's sort of like that. What is the... Right. You have to... I mean, you just have to start accumulating whether you believe it or not. And I personally, again, I prefer you don't believe it. <laughs> um, you know, just begin accumulating the facts that you can you know, you can verify. And, um, and really be careful where you get the facts from because if you see documents obtained by someone that, you know, they say are official, I've seen the most ridiculous things on the internet. Um, you know, here's a, a report from some government agency going, yeah, everything Bob Lazar said is fabricated and we've verified it with the main office in Philadelphia. And I mean, you know, just nonsense stuff. Um, you know, verify it yourself. And if you start adding up all the facts, look, the people that were with me at the time, you know, have an obvious advantage. 
because they knew me before all this stuff happened. They knew you know, at the time, I didn't even believe in flying saucers or life from other planets. I mean, to me, those were just crazy people that bought into these stories. Coming to the end here. Um, you know, I guess you, you'd say, can you, could you really keep a secret right, like that? Wouldn't it leak out? Well, it has leaked out. You know, it's, it's whether or not you pay attention to it or not that, that matters. One of the guys, if there's anybody who would know uh, about this being true, it's a guy named Ben Rich, who was the head of Skunk Works, which was the Lockheed company that built all the blackest projects, the SR-71, the U-2, Stealth, all of that. Ben Rich, who headed up Skunk Works for such a long time, if anyone in the civilian sector would know, it would be him. So I asked him about it. On the day that they unveiled the stealth fighter at Nellis Air Force Base, they had it sitting on a tarmac, and they invited uh, the media to come in, and I was the one of the guys that was there that day. And so Ben Rich was available for interviews, and I went up and asked him. Um, Mr. Rich, great to meet you. I asked him a couple of questions and then led up to this one. You know, a lot of people say there's alien technology and stuff that you developed. And he stops for a second, looks at me, and he kind of laughs. Nope, just good old American know-how. But before he died, Ben Rich said this in a public uh, comment, because and the reason I'm asking is friends of his had asked about UFOs and he said it was real. But he said this to an engineering audience. He said, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do it. We have the technology to take ET home. It won't take someone's lifetime to do it. We have that capability now to travel to the stars. He died a few months after that, but he was trying to tell the world something. This stuff is real, um, that what Bob has said is real. Uh, I'll end with one last little piece of Bob because, you know, people wonder what goes on in his life. There's all those rumors I told you about before, and I put him the, qu the question to him in a couple of different ways about whether he would do it again. And he goes back and forth. Basically, I think he would say no, but here's what he told me back in May. But that drives him crazy. I mean, That's you need fine. to answer this. Now, I need an answer. How much? How many times do you get that in a, in a week still after all this oh, time? Oh, I get, you I get, there isn't that. a day I, I don't get emails. And, you know, I try and get this across to him. Look, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You know, well, I don't believe the story. Great, pass it around. <laughs> you know, I really don't want you to because it makes life difficult for me. I'm trying to do serious research. I'm, you know, I've got contract with governments and other companies for... R&D work and aside from, you know, other scientific interests, and I want this divorced. Look, if I went and did everything I can to prove my story and reached a tipping point for where people like Stanton Friedman and, you know, people uh, uh, along those lines um, said, you know what, this is beginning to look factual. Do you know how that would annihilate me? That would destroy my business. It would make it impossible for me to operate. And, you know, I'd have a continuous flow of questions, annoying people, I'm sure offers to do things that I am not the least bit interested in. There's got to be part of you somewhere in there, even though it would be counterproductive. There's got to be part of you that wishes, God damn it, I, I know what happened, it's true. No, look, I know what happened, it's true. There's no doubt, period. There's, there's no delusion. And there are some things I can say that that will bolster the case, and I'm not going to. Um, it's going to stay that way. I do regret, at this point, bringing anything forward. Look, at the time, I'm in my early 20s. I went, you know what? This is a crime against the American people. This is just BS, and everybody deserves to know what's going on. You know, and 25 years goes by, you get a little older, and your priorities change. And, you know, what they told me is, this is a security matter, and really, what's the public going to do without this? You know how reactionary they are? It's, there's a bunch of different reasons this is being kept quiet. Nothing that they bother telling me, but the bottom line is they're right. The bulk of the people are complete morons. And I'm sorry, maybe they are right. And this really should just be, <laughs> just be information that's handled out on a, on a need-to-know basis to some people where it would benefit them. 
You know, I, I know you don't like to hear it, but there's a lot of people, after you're in this field for a long time, you kind of come to the same conclusion. Maybe, maybe it doesn't really need to be out. Um, I believe in the people's right to know. That's my job. And so I pursue it in that, that vein. But you have to wonder whether it's really a good idea or not. You know, the, the pursuit of this story has led me, it's taken me all over the world chasing different kind of UFO stuff. Uh, my views have changed so much from, from those days about just thinking of nuts and bolts, flying saucers, is there a government cover-up? I mean, this is really, uh, as uh, earlier speakers were su suggesting, it's a uh, it's much bigger mystery than, than that, whether or not flying saucers are coming from other planets or not. Jacques Vallée, uh, my hero in the UFO field, I had interviewed him back in these days when he came to investigate Lazar and ask me some questions, and we'd become much closer friends. But he said, I'm going to be so disappointed if it turns out that the answer to the UFO mystery is that uh, aliens are coming from another planet and flying saucers to visit us. Because he suggests that the, the way these uh, craft behave, the technology they have, it suggests that the ultimate answer is so much bigger, so much more wondrous uh, than something as simple as that. Uh, these things that we see in the sky are just a small part of something much bigger. You know, the universe is far more, more mysterious than maybe we can imagine or can imagine. And the glimpses that we get of these craft are, I think, part of some much larger learning curve. Uh, the, this is about reality itself, uh, the nature of the world around us. And I get the feeling that we can understand it only a, a tiny sliver and that its true nature is being withheld from us and maybe is beyond the ability of our small, tiny brains to understand, but you know, we have to try. Uh, I, I think that it is the duty of scientists and journalists to investigate the unexplained, not to explain the uninvestigated. Um, and thank you very much.